Welcome to the Startup Grind. So without further ado, I'd just love, like to welcome you all to this space. Um, it's a very small, intimate group, which is, which is epic. And um, for those of you that don't know Kyron, he is a freedom investor. He's also part of the entrepreneur community uh, in Bali. Uh, he's someone that lives on the West Coast where I live as well and works from co-working spaces and cafes and all that type of stuff. Um, <laughs> well, works, right? Um, but also, he's just an all-round good human and he loves helping the entrepreneur, entrepreneur movement. And uh, we're lucky enough to have him to come interview Andrea tonight. So, Kyron, love to welcome you up here. Big round of applause. Thank you all for that warm welcome. Uh, this is the second time I've hosted Startup Grind here in Bali, so I'm excited. I'm really excited because we have the whole female empowerment theme coming through iLab at the moment, and we've got an amazing female co-founder who we're going to be interviewing. The whole point of Startup Grind is to get in there, figure out how Andrea has been able to start up her business, all the challenges she's overcome. And when I was uh, doing the pre-interview, I found out there's going to be some pretty interesting stories there. Uh, but what's quite exciting for me is being outside of America, we kind of do entrepreneurship and business differently. So this is the first chance I've had to really talk to someone who's in the tech space who has followed that Silicon Valley system or, or the way where you go through and you come up with a concept and you start bringing on funders. So we're going to dive into that scene a lot too. One, because I find it interesting. I think you guys will find it interesting too. And it's completely different to generally how the rest of the world does entrepreneurship. So without further ado, I'd like to invite my guest for tonight, Andrea Lubier. She is the co-founder of Mailbird, uh, which is an email client. And we're going to jump more into the story she's had coming from being in a job to how she started up to how she's able to work with a distributed team all around the world living in Bali today. Thank you. So, tell us how it all began. Ooh, from the beginning. Maybe, maybe not quite the beginning. <laughs> I think, I think I we all understand in. the childhood years. <laughs> but, but if you want to give a quick uh, background to yourself... Uh, I know your, you know, where you come from is a very complicated answer as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe touching on to that and then a little bit more about what you're currently doing and then we'll break into how you got into that. Sure. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, again, my name is Andrea Lubier. Um, I am the CEO of an email company that I started in 2012 and I started it in Bali. Um, and it kind of started, I was working with a software company um, for about a year. Um, I was in the content department and I was living in Ohio in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I was kind of just thinking like, okay, you know, what's my next step in my, in my career path? You know, where do I want to go? I had actually grew up in Jakarta. Um, so I lived in Jakarta from 1991 to 1999. And then my family moved to Ohio um, after that. And I was in Ohio for 13 years. And I was kind of like, why am I still here? Like, I can definitely see myself not living in Ohio anymore. Um, so I started looking around for job opportunities, and uh, I started talking to some friends that were, you know, starting their own companies, tech companies, in um, Southeast Asia. And I really wanted to go back to Southeast Asia, having, having grown up in Jakarta. Um, so I started talking to some people, and a friend of mine who was living in Bali at the time, um, attending an entrepreneurial event, much like you guys are doing right now, um, in Bali, suggested like, oh, actually, I have a friend, you know, they're thinking about starting a, a company. Uh, maybe you guys can have a chat. It could be interesting for you, you know, just have a chat. I was like, okay, cool. Um, so I met my co-founder, whose name is Michael, and uh, we had a chat about Mailbird, and we decided to start building this company. So you can imagine I was, I had a full-time job working at this software company. Um, I was, you know, going into work, you know, beating rush hour traffic in my car, every morning, and then I would come home and I would start working on building the business that we've been running today for the last six years, um, working on Mailbird till 2 a.m., and then getting up the next day, going to work, coming back home, working on it. So I was already working on this business before moving to Bali. And then in 2012, I moved to Bali, and I met my business partners, my co-founders, for the first time. And then it kind of just took off from there. First time for everything. So... <laughs> Interesting. So I think there's one question everyone here is dying to know, and that's, what's it like living in Jakarta compared to Bali? 
Oh no, my so, sorry, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, so, so, so <laughs> you had never actually met your co-founders in person until you came back to Bali? That's correct, yeah. Never met them in person. Okay, I told you about these some gold nuggets. So how does that work then? Because there's got to be a lot of trust, and had you already done share options within the business? Because I know it's a, a U.S. company, right? Mm -hmm. So, bef like, we were not a U.S. company for the first, like, four years of the company being operational. <laughs> we were not incorporated. Um, so we're kind of just, like, floating along, starting this business. Like, this is the first time I'd ever started a company. So, I, like, a lot of this stuff on what you need to do legally, you know, with incorporation and all this stuff, and, you know, divvying up shares and ownership of the company, I was like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I had no idea. So, like, yeah, I didn't meet my co-founder, uh, my co-founders in person yet, but I did, of course, have what we do today, video, you know, chat meetings with them. And so you kind of, you know, we kind of did this even before, like, being up here. Yeah, we took, like, to get to know each other and see, you know, how it would go. Um, and, yeah, so you kind of build the trust already just from that from that point on. Um, and then, yeah, the next step was to actually meet in person, and we established kind of the trust from there moving forward, and yeah, it's naturally happened, I think, yeah. That's fantastic. So to, to get this straight, you, you meet online, well, you meet online. <laughs> this is one of those stories. It's a dating app now. <laughs> um, but but you, you, you get connected to each other, and then because you're actually building something, right, and that's kind of the difference between, I guess, starting a business and then going the tech route, where you're coming out with a platform or a, a tech product, because you're going to have to code, you're going to do all the creation of the actual thing. So until that's created, you don't really have a product or a company, which is why you never incorporated. Yes and no. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, we just never incorporated because we were kind of hosted under a separate company at one point in time, which was incorporated in Hong Kong. And it was almost like an informal accelerator or incubator, if you will. Um, so we, they kind of helped us along because there were entrepreneurs in this group and this community that had started businesses before. And so for someone coming in to, to starting their own business for the first time and not knowing anything about it and what to do, having a million questions, it was a really gr great way to kind of like guide yourself through that process. Like, so, I mean, it all just kind of, I don't know, it, did I answer the question? I don't know if I answered the question. Um, yeah, yeah, I think you answered okay. the question. Um, I didn't realize there was a Hong Kong side to it. Oh, too. Yeah, okay. We're truly going global tonight. Um, it, it, I, I generally have this tendency to do things back to front where I set up the actual company entity because in New Zealand it's like $200, right? You can just set up companies exactly. like that and then you're like, oh, what am I supposed to do with it now and end up closing them down and costing a whole heap of accountants fees but that's a whole other story for later. So, so you're now here. Uh, you've come back to Bali. Is this when you moved here? Yeah, 2012. I, I came. Well, I came to Bali just to kind of meet my my co-founders. Um, I didn't know if I was actually going to stay here, you know, long term, but I fell in love with it. Like, cause how could you not? Um, and I decided to to permanently move here. So, awesome. Yeah. And did you have an actual proper running, well, proper running company with clients, paying clients, and everyone by that point? We when we launched, we had a soft public launch um, April 2nd of 2012. We were almost going to launch on April 1st, which we were like, that's stupid. Um, yeah. April Fool's Day. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we launched April 2nd, 2012, and we got our first paying customer within the first couple of days. I still remember the guy's name, too. I don't know, maybe it, his name was Brian. I know his last name, but to conceal the identity. <laughs> but yeah, Brian, I remember that was the first guy that actually paid us money for our software, and it was like, wow, this is amazing, you know? So yeah, that that feeling of the first yeah, money coming yeah. in, even if it's like There's one dollar, here, right? Yeah. You're like, yeah. oh my god, I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So, how long had it taken then, uh, from the point of meeting the co-founders, deciding to go ahead with this? I imagine you all then jumped in the metaphoric garage and started hacking away. How long until you had that first dollar come in? Well, remember, like, before I even came to Bali, like, I was already starting on working on the business, even with a full-time job. I was doing that, like, late at night, um, every evening. So it took about a full year of building a business plan, getting, you know, the MVP, the min minimum viable product, um, operational. It was terrible. Wow. When we first had it done, it was just like, wow, this really, how are we going to sell this? <laughs> I was even talking to my co-founder at that point. Yeah, so it took about a year to answer the question. Um, but I was even talking to my co-founder at that point in time. And I was like, okay, so how are we going to sell this? And he's like, well, I don't know. I was hoping you could figure that out. And I was like, <laughs> okay, um, what do I got to work with here? <laughs> so 
Um, but yeah, it took a good year, a lot of conversations back and forth, and literally starting everything from scratch. And that was awesome, because you literally have nothing, and each day you chip away at it, you start building your business plan, you start testing things, you start talking to people, and it just starts to evolve. And then, you, and then you have to sit down with your team, right, and like say, okay, what date are we actually gonna put this out there publicly for the world to see? And that's really scary, that was like super scary. Um, but yeah, so a good year of, of just building, iterating, planning, and yeah. I think a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs get stuck in this phase before public launch, um, where it's like, oh, it's not ready, like I wanna perfect it, it has to be perfect, oh, yeah. but yeah. Time and time again, I got advice from other friends that were entrepreneurs that were like, just get it out there, you know? You, you don't have any information until you get it out there, so. Yeah. Imperfect action is better than imperfect, in, perfect inaction. Imperfect action is better than imperfect, perfect inaction. Oh, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> <laughs> they say, as, as uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's the other saying? Uh, if you're not embarrassed by your first prototype, then you launch too late. We'll, we'll stick with that one. That's a little bit easier to say. So you spent an entire year working behind the scenes before anyone had even seen anything. When you, what was the problem that you identified for Mailbird to be able to solve, and how was it different from anything else on the market uh, at the time? Okay, so I think a, a critical part of when you're starting a company is timing. Um, so it's like, okay, we're looking at communication technologies, information communications technologies. What's out there? Um, and looking at a, a ton of research and stats, like time and time again, the most common and most popular form of communication is email, even today, despite people saying, oh, email's dying, like, no. <laughs> it is the number one activity that we do online every day. Um, so with that being said, um, around the time, there was another company for um, Mac. It was an email client called Sparrow. I don't know if any of you, if anyone here is on Mac. Um, knows about Sparrow, but it was a really nice email client that all it was is was a native software application that worked with Gmail. So all Gmail users that were tired of, you know, dealing with their emails on the web um, downloaded the software. They paid like 10 bucks a year for it, and that was it. So around the time, right before we launched, Google had bought um, Sparrow. So we're like, hmm, this is interesting. Um, and we started looking around to see, because Sparrow was only for Mac, we started looking around to see what was available for Windows. And on Windows, you had Outlook. And everyone hates Outlook. <laughs> Everyone's bitching about Outlook. So um, yeah, so it was timing right around that time when we decided to launch. And so that was one thing. There was, there was nothing that was just a really simple, streamlined, like easy to use email client like Sparrow for Windows. So when we actually launched Mailbird in 2012, um, we launched as the Sparrow for Windows. And that like helped us grow organically really, really fast. And that was just, that was just timing. It was good timing for us. Um, so there's that. Cool, C can we jump in yeah, and yeah, yeah. dumb it right down yeah. to all the, the non-tech people in the world? Sure who don't understand what Sparrow for Windows means. Sure. Or, um, or what yeah. an email client actually sure. does. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I, so an email client is basically a software that you download to your computer, and it allows you to send and receive emails from it. Um, so if any of you guys have ever used Outlook, has anyone here not used Outlook? Like, or has everyone here used Outlook? Yeah, okay, so you guys know what it, okay. So Outlook, is, in essence, is an email client. Other ones out there are, was like Sparrow. So software you download, you can manage your Gmail accounts from it. Um, other ones like Mac Mail, like if you have a Mac, that's the basic you know, mail client that you have on your Mac. So it's, it's a software tool that allows you to send and receive emails. That's basically it. And yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, it plugs into other email systems, right? So if you've yeah. got like five different yeah. email addresses, they all come to one email? Yeah. Yep. So the reason why people opt for an email client versus managing their mail on the web is because, for a number of reasons, um, offline access. Um, in the case that you're traveling and working and you don't have internet for whatever reason, you have access to your mails because it downloads to the clients. So that's one thing. Another thing is account management when you have multiple accounts. Um, a lot of the web-based email clients or, or providers or like Gmail and stuff, they're limited to just Gmail Whereas if you have a client, like, like with Mailbird, you can manage your Yahoo, your Outlook, your private domains, all of it from one place. So, um, so that's, that's one element of it. Um, it's faster as well when you have an email client versus web. So there's, there's a number of reasons though, yeah. Awesome. 
So it's now 2012. You've just launched on April 2nd, as to not be a joke. Uh, I, I love yes. that. That's actually so important. We didn't you're, think about that, yeah. You're, you're we, talking it, about timing, right? Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but that's a massive thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so you've just launched. What does the next 12 months look like? Whew. Um, so we had some sales targets, some um, sales targets that we set. Um, so it was basically like gathering as much data and as much feedback as we could, segmenting it, organizing it, and pulling out inferences from that data. Um, so we, ha we found out really quickly, just within the first week, a lot of things that people loved about Mailbird and a lot of things that people hated about Mailbird. Um, so our development team, our engineering team, were like incredible. They were super fast to, to adapt the product really quickly. Because um, you have bugs and stuff too, right, when you launch. And we try to test everything perfectly, but even like the most, the biggest, you know, applications that are out there um, by big corporations still have bugs in their software. Um, so yeah, it, it started with sales targets, cleaning up the software so the performance of it was really, really good, and just growth, growth, growth. That was it. Get as many users to download, yeah. Nice. So what's your actual business model then? Because I know mm -hmm. the way things work in you know, the tech space is, is very different mm -hmm. to a lot of more traditional businesses, even traditional online businesses. So, um, so you've already talked about development teams. Um, how did you build those teams and what's the actual business model behind Mailbird? Well, um, are you guys familiar with freemium-based models? So that's what we started with because all the only thing that mattered was downloads, getting people to download and use the software and so we could get the feedback and iterate and improve. Um, so yeah, that was uh, how we started, a free model. We did have a paid version, like I said. So the paid version, we're like, ah, I don't know. Like, you know, how, how could we differentiate this? I think it had like two extra features that the free version didn't have. Um, but someone paid us for it. So we're like, cool, this is awesome. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, the answer to the business model question, freemium based with a subscription based. And then we learned from that later down the line that people didn't want to pay subscriptions for software. So we introduced another price option, which was a lifetime option. So you could pay once and be done with it. It was obviously the most expensive one, um, but then you, if you were someone who does not like paying a subscription, then that was your, your option. Um, so that was the business model, yeah. Perfect. Now it's, it's changed a lot too still. Yeah. It has changed. Well, in terms of price points and okay. also other channels that we used yeah, to generate revenue, so. Okay, cool. Let's jump into the whole VC side of things uh, because Typically, tech goes one of two ways, uh, where you go for the buyout, uh, where you know, you're talking about growth, getting, bringing on the users, and then going for a buyout like Sparrow did with Google. Uh, uh, yeah, Google. Um, or else you go kind of, well, is there any other way? It's not really the cash flowing way, An is IPO, it? yeah. IPO, yeah. Exit, what else? Facebook kind of tried to do that. Merger and acquisition. So, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, th I guess there's a lot of different routes. You so, or you so could just be like, no, I'm going to hold on to it and just so, keep it So when you yeah. set it up, did you have an exit strategy? Um, <sighs> that was also kind of a little undecided when we started. Um, initially, when we started Mailbird, it was kind of like, okay, we're going to build a lifestyle business. So we weren't looking to fundraise. We weren't looking to like have this crazy, you know, like Facebook kind of company. Um, but later down the line, when we started looking at where we wanted to be, that then became kind of the, the next st step for us. So it's like, okay, if we want to get to this phase by this time, we need extra funds in order to invest those funds into growing to get to reach those goals. So it started off as a lifestyle business and later down the road, it turned into an exit. Um, we wanted to work towards an exit. So that involved fundraising. So yeah. I just want to point out your lifestyle business involved you working a job and then working, hacking away until 2 a.m. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Everyone's got their own first, lifestyle, first, right? Yeah, or at least, I don't know. I get, I, I'm assuming most people can relate. When you're starting a new company, it's it's quite intensive. You don't have much time. <laughs> we, we'll jump into else. that yeah. side then, now then, uh, because it, even though you are going for the, you're still going for the exit? Yeah, yeah. still working towards it. But you've actually got the lifestyle because you live here in Bali. So yep. you wake up every so, morning, yeah. <laughs> go for a surf, come back, surf the internet. T it's tell, good play me, on words there. <laughs> t tell me a little bit more about how you're able to set yourself up so that you could have a, a distributed team across the world 
and how you manage that and, and what ma made you just, I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? But what made you decide to live in Bali um, rather than like going full steam, maybe moving to Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. exiting, and then retiring in Bali? Um, I guess you can argue now that it is, it's a nice little combination of both. Um, I'm going to do a plug for, for Igor over here, who works for Time Doctor. They're actually having a conference coming up uh, called Running Remote. And it's all about um, teams that, similar to our company, that are fully distributed and have a uh, remote, yeah, fully remote team. Um, so in a sense, it's kind of half lifestyle, half, uh, yeah, big exit, you know, high growth company that we're, we're working towards. Um, but yeah, like I... I don't know how to answer the question, honestly, though, like, because it's a, it's a little mix of both. I don't know. I. What made like, you decide not to be based in the U.S.? To not be based in the U.S., well, that's an easy one to answer. It's the fact that operational costs we could keep much lower in Southeast Asia. So, yeah. If, so if you, you, moved, you built your team from people in Southeast Asia? Yes, our, our, like half of our team are people from Indonesia. Yeah, okay. and incredible, brilliant people. Like there's some really incredible local talent in Indonesia if you're looking to hire engineers. Um, there's a really prestigious school in Bandung called ITB, which is an international, uh, or sorry, the in International Institute of Technology in Bandung. Um, and there's some, we hired our first two engineers from there. So. Like, Indonesia is a, a fast-growing country when it comes to uh, tech. So I think uh, that's also why we decided to start here. Yeah, I know Java has a lot of, uh, a lot of really interesting players in the tech space too, yeah. especially yeah, Yogi Akata with the, uh, the fintech side of things. Mm -hmm. but I haven't made it to Java. I can't escape the Bali bubble. Um, but do you want to go into a little bit more detail sure. about the distributed team? Yeah. Uh, what sort of countries around the world you are all located in, how you are able to travel. Um, yeah. That's Just how we set it up, yeah. Um, so, I mean, we kind of started already initially. So I came to Bali, I met my, my co-founder, one of my co-founders. He was not, not intending on staying in Bali to like live long term, I, I did. So it already kind of started that way. Um, and so when we started hiring, we were like, okay, you know, we don't want to limit our, the talent pool to just, you know, our vicinity. Um, we already have, you know, two business partners wor working on other ends of the world. So um, when we started doing our first recruiting after the, the two engineers, we started opening it up to the rest of the world. So, um, yeah, we just started looking at, at people from anywhere. And so the onboarding process that we usually use is we give every new team member that joins us a three-month probationary period. Um, and this is really to just evaluate if the cultural fit is good, and if they can basically take care of themselves and they don't have to be babysat, because I'm not like, I did not want to have a company where I was going to be standing over people's shoulders, making sure they're doing their work. Like, we're adults, right? So that was a big part of it with building um, a distributed team. Also having the right tools um, to do it. Um, everyone asks all the time, like, how do you guys manage and communicate and stuff? Like, obviously, asynchronously, and we're in the business of email, which is like the form of asynchronous e uh, communication. Um, so asynchronously. The one thing that we do differently, however, is um, every week, every Monday, I do meet with the team. Um, so everyone all over the world. I mean, we have people in Copenhagen, um, in Austria, in the US, in Japan, in Spain. Do we have them? Uh, where else do we have them? Indonesia. It, well, obviously Indonesia, yeah. <laughs> um, France, yeah, France, um, Canada. So really, like every different time zone. Yes. Ah, yes. So this is the fun one. It really sucks for some people, and for other people, it's okay. <laughs> um, so Christine, she's uh, she works with us. Um, we are on the meetings on Monday at 9 p.m. And then we have another one after that with a smaller team within the company at 10 p.m. So we have a pretty late Mondays. Um, whereas other people, they start their, their days at 6 a.m. They have to be awake at that time in order to make the meeting. So you, that's, that's part of that three-month probationary period when you're building a fully distributed team is, you know, are these people able to be flexible um, with their time? If you're looking for a 9-to-5 job where you go to an office, like, sorry, no, not going to work. As the CEO, can't you set your times? I, I just had a call with my team before where one girl, it was 4.30 in the morning. I was like, well, that's your fault, not mine. 
I try to be fair. <laughs> like, I mean, if I, if I really want, I would love to have it at like, you know, 8 a.m. my time here. But yeah, I try to accommodate. So you, even as the CEO of the company, you also have to be flexible. Like not only your team members have to be flexible, but you as well. So I think that's part of it. Of course. Yeah. So now you've got a distributed team, you've got a US-based corporation, and you're looking to raise funds from a VC. Let's, let's talk about some of those challenges and how you'd overcome that. OK. okay. Hmm. I can share with you the challenges that I've had. Has anyone here tried fundraising? Yes, we have one in the back. Cool. OK. Does anyone here plan on fundraising? No? OK, a couple of yeses, yeah. some no's. Yeah, OK. Um, if I could advise to not fundraise, that's what I would say. Like, don't do it. It's a freaking nightmare. And it takes a lot of time and energy away from you focusing on your business. Um, but it depends on the motivation for fundraising. Like, I think it was this big blitz in Silicon Valley. You hear all these success stories of these unicorn companies who, you know, they fundraise, oh, they raise billions of dollars, and now they're skyrocketing, and la, 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 la. OK, great. But if you can build your business without having someone else owning it, um, successfully, if you can do it on your own, do it. Like, absolutely. Now, fundraising, we decided to do it because we wanted the funds to invest in growing our team and investing more funds into marketing um, that we didn't really have. Um, so we, at some point, did reach um, profitability. So when we did that, we were like, okay, great. But still, you still needed that extra cushion of funds to get to that next stage. Because um, we set milestones on our roadmap of where we wanted to be. So, that required extra funds. So we started doing it, and it was a challenge. Um, so when, when you live in Bali and you're talking to investors, it doesn't usually go very well. Um, <laughs> number one, they don't take you very seriously. Um, and then we'll even talk about maybe a little bit too, like as a female founder of this tech company, you know, like how, how I was, um, I guess, treated or how people responded to that, um, especially when I went to, te to tech conferences. Um, so yeah, it, it was tough. And so I, I think what I mentioned before is that like a lot of investors, and depending on where, where you're talking to them, like if they're in Silicon Valley, people are like, oh, they just really believe in the team. If you're talking to a VC in Asia, they're like, let me see your numbers. Let's do due diligence like full on. Um, so it's just very different, like the mindset. And what I've found is a lot of uh, VC venture capital firms, they really want you to be like, you know, in their neighborhood. <laughs> so if I'm talking to a venture capital firm that is based in, let's say, Palo Alto, California, it's Anderson Horowitz, yeah, you're talking to them, no. <laughs> um, I'm just, just hypothetically speaking, right? And, you know, then they start asking you about where is your team, where are your co-founders, how do you guys do this, how do you... They're really not um, comfortable, I would say, with this yet. So I think this is something that will be changing and evolving quite uh, fast uh, in the next coming years, because more and more companies are building very distributed remote teams. So I think it'll be like inevitable that you know fund or uh, investors will have to get used to that. Um, but yeah, it was a challenge, and you know you don't know how to have these conversations. That was the other thing, like having that first conversation with an investor is quite scary. Like you're like okay, what do I need to know? Like, you're like, memorize all your numbers. And like, so it was quite scary. Um, but you just do it and you get a lot of no's. Actually, they will never say no. Well, you're an investor, so tell me. <laughs> I'm gonna drill you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they will, an investor will never say no. So this is the interesting thing. They'll say, well, keep us posted. We're just, it's not the right time for us right now, but keep us posted. We wanna follow, you know, where you guys are in the next, like six months. Okay, maybe the next year. So that's really funny. That's them be saying no, but they don't want to say no because they don't want to miss out. If you do actually blow up, they don't want to miss out on having missed out on, on that investment deal. Um, so that was a challenge. I think um, talking to investors and fundraising when you have a distributed team uh, and what else? Yeah, I, I, the, the other thing too is incorporation. Um, so if I was talking to a investor in the US and they're like, wait, so where, do you have a US company or is it a Hong Kong company? And then that was like, okay, no, we, we want you to be a US company. And we want like 90% of your team to be sitting in America in the same office. So it, yeah, so that was a, a time and time again, the same challenge. Um, 
In Asia, I think with the, a lot of the investors I talked to, most of them were actually in Singapore. Um, they're trying to build, I think, a lot of uh, initiatives for tech startups and whatnot um, in Singapore, so a lot of investment has been going into this. They have all these like uh, schemes like the NRF grant, which is like a government um, scheme that you have to apply, but then you have to have like local um, team members like operating in Singapore, but there's also like these workarounds for that too. Um, so yeah, I, there's just, there's so many different things depending on, you know, how much you're fundraising and where you're fundraising from. And I don't really have advice actually on, on how to do it. I wish I did, but yeah. What, what was the weirdest reason you got a no, well, a non-no for? My, my one, by the oh, way, is yeah. I need to go and do the numbers. Let's let yeah, know. Yeah, but most people, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, the, the weirdest one I thought for me was I, I was just like, really? Um, they said no without really saying no, but they say we only invest in companies that want to, to go IPO. Like, I was like, okay, well, like, you're really, Facebook did not plan on, you know, going public, you know, when they started. So I, I thought that was a weird way to, <laughs> to rule you out. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I thought that was a weird one. Um, but yeah, so, but we did, we did, in fact, uh, raise um, some funds. And how that worked out is I was attending quite aggressively a lot of the tech conferences. So at the tech conferences, a lot of investors go there. You meet other startups as well. So you get to network and stuff, and that's really nice. Um, but it was someone who I didn't, I honestly was not thinking we were going to be made an offer, you know, uh, for investment in our company. But, like, we just went out. We were talking, you know, about the business. And there were a bunch of after, you know, conference uh, events. So, yeah, we started chit-chatting, and then I think what it was, too, so this is interesting, is my co-founder is Danish, this investor is Danish as well, so we had the Danish connection there a little bit, so that sometimes helps, too, which is funny, as it is. Um, but, yeah, the guy just was, he was really, the investor was just really great in that he really believed in our team, he was, he saw, you know, our, our metrics, and he was really proud of that and excited about that, so he invested, so. And he was an entrepreneur himself, so that's great. If you can find an investor who's been an entrepreneur in the past, that's great because they really understand, you know, what it takes to build a company. So even if you have a month that looks terrible, they're like, I get it. Like, I understand what you did here. You were probably testing something out, you know, and it didn't work out. Most investors, though, they will be like, what happened here? Your, your sales and revenue is terrible this month. So, yeah. I don't know. But you're on the other side. So <laughs> I'm curious, yeah, what, what your experience has been like with this. I'm, I'm, I'm more real estate investing uh, than okay, okay, okay. companies. All right. Um, same, same, but different. As we like to say in Bali. Um, so you touched on it before then that you have actually experienced a lot of, I wouldn't quite say negative feedback, but a, a lot of hurdles simply from being female. And there's obviously, the, you know, we're here with a, a female empowerment uh, iLab group, but also there's very few female CEOs, very few female tech startups. Um, so being the CEO and the, one of the co-founders, how have you had to overcome that? How have you had to uh, really bust your way through a, a male-orientated world, yet without losing that feminine charm? Okay, that's a it, that's a it, that's a really interesting question. I actually have, have written about this quite a lot because it's a subject that interests me quite a lot, um, and that is usually the question that is asked of of women entrepreneurs. Is like. What are the obstacles? You know, how much harder was it for you to be in this male-dominated industry? If you are in tech, maybe some of you guys are in other industries, whatever. Um, and th there definitely are some challenges, which are, which I'll address. But I also found on the upside that there were some opportunities in this. Um, like when I went to my first tech conference was in Jakarta, and I went there, and everyone's like, because I did a demo. I did my first. I was so nervous. I was on stage. I was like demoing, you know, our software, our business. And like a bunch of people came up to me after and they're like, oh my God, like great presentation. I was like, I blacked out. Like I don't remember half the time what I was saying up there, you know, when I, when I did the presentation. Um, and everyone was just like really impressed to see like a female CEO on stage, like representing their company and, and building a tech company at that. So I was like, wow, this is cool. But at the same time, you're like, why are they so surprised, you know? Yeah. Um, and so one thing, too, is that I didn't come from a tech background. Um, so I think a lot of people assumed that I was an engineer, and that's how I got into this. And I tell people, like, that's a reason why some people will say, I will never start a tech company, is because I don't come from a technical background. Like, you, you, you don't need to have a technical background, you know, to start a tech company. Um, you hire great people that have tech background, technical backgrounds to work with you. So 
that's another subject, but um, a little bit there. Um, so the female um, experience as a founder, how did I address that otherwise? Um, so at this conference that I went to, again, I was like in the 1% um, of women that were attending. So that was kind of weird. And then the more tech conferences that I went to after that, um, I would, over the years, I would slowly see more and more women attending them, so that was cool. I was like, all right, awesome. Um, now, the next part of that is how many of them were, you know, actually, you know, the business founders or CEOs or, or in an executive role within those companies. Um, and so that was still a little lower when I was talking to some of the women at the conferences. Um, I, I, can even <laughs> I can even share a, an example of a conference that I went to. It was in, uh, in Singapore. Um, so I had, you know, we had our mail bird booth over here, really proud of it, and like standing, to, you know, and like an investor comes up and he's like, yeah, um, so you guys are doing the marketing for um, this company? I was like, no, I'm the CEO of this company. Like, so that was funny. And then on the other side of me, there was another guy, and he had his booth, and he had these like very like sexily you know dressed ladies in like short short skirts like prancing around his booth, and he had a shitload of people at his booth. I was like, okay, this is not fair, you know. Um, and it was funny. It was he was so. The story is he one of the girls was actually the founder of this company's wife, and he was having her talking to people and to, like investors as well and saying like, hey, yeah, this is our company. Let me introduce you to our CEO. So it was almost like using the, the ladies as bait to get like the right people to talk to the founder, which I thought I was like, okay, that's creative, but like I don't like that, like, you know, either. So I, I mean, these are like some of the experiences that you have, right? Um, being in the, in the tech industry as a, as a woman. Um, Asia is very different though when you compare it to um, the U.S. Um, in the U.S., I think it's a lot more ahead in the sense of, you know, inclusion, um, more women, you know, that are very independent and, like, really are, like, pursuing starting their own company. Um, so it's just very different cultures, I think. So it's cool to be in, in Asia and kind of be like, yeah, ladies, like, you could do it, you know? You don't have to be, like, the marketing girl wearing your tiny little skirt walking around. To, like, so, yeah, I don't know. That, that there's, th these are just some of the experiences. There's many others I can probably talk about on and on, but um, it's getting better. It's definitely getting better. Um, and I try to, instead of looking at the problems with it, I try to look at the opportunities with it. Um, so if someone's surprised, you know, that you're running a, a tech company, it's like, well, have a conversation with them and like tell them how it, how it all started. So people learn, so things change, so. That's a very long-winded answer to that question. <laughs> it, it, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. I think it's uh, a major thing most people want to know. And I do think the whole sexism of women everywhere in the, the world is a major problem. So we're going to be opening it up to you guys in the audience for questions very soon. In fact, I'm going to ask one more question, and then it's your turn. What's next with Mailbird? Ooh. Um, OK, so we now have a team of 13 people, again, fully distributed across the world. Um, we've been an email client for Windows that also works with many other really cool apps that people use today to work and communicate. Um, but our next big move is we're actually going to bring it to mobile. So we've been getting a lot of people requesting Mailbird on mobile. So hopefully this year you'll see it on uh, Android first. So we're only on Windows. Everyone's like, when are you going to have it for Mac? I'm like, not yet. I was, not I was, yet. About to ask <laughs> that too. I was checking it out today. I was like, holy shit, this looks awesome. They're like, Windows, what? Uses Windows anymore. Yeah. yeah, well, it's still like 82% of the overall market share is on Windows, which is crazy. We, which is yeah. the important thing about knowing who your market is, right? Yeah. So, awesome. Cool. So, I'm going to open it up to everyone in the crowd. Uh, given Andrea's experience, uh, you know, coming through the whole female co founder, CEO, uh, distributed teams, being everywhere in the world, VCs, startups, I think we've covered a lot today. What would be your biggest question? So start by introducing yourself, where you're from, and your company. Uh, hello. Hi. It's nice to hear you. Thank you. Um, I'm Erica. I run a company called Career Matters. It's a, a consultancy um, based in London that helps organizations to um, embed career conversations in their, in their culture and therefore keep their best people. And I also, I have a side hustle nice. <laughs> uh, for the Church of Pixel. Um, the Church of Pixel is a digital creative agency. So, um, and I, I'm in London and Tuscany. Ooh, so, nice. Uh, yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, the th I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about financials that I'm curious about. So uh, one was, um, what year did you become profitable? And the second is, when did you start paying yourself? And what was your first paycheck? <laughs> oh, this is good. Um, yeah, I basically did not have a paycheck um, for the first two years of running the company. And the first year that we were profitable was also when I first got my first paycheck, real paycheck, right? Like an actual, like, okay, I can actually do something with this. I'm not living off of my savings anymore. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was about two years, which is quite long. Some people can turn that around faster, um, but you know, this first time, so it was like a lot of time exerted onto learning, understanding, changing the product, looking at data, iterating again over and over and over, over two years. So it took some time, um, yeah. And one other question then on, on that also is about sort of employment law and logistics. Mm. So if you've got a distributed team, everybody is uh, subject to different tax rules, different employee legislation. Is everybody a freelance contractor or are they on a, we call it PAYE, are they on an actual, um, do they have a contract? This is a really good question. And yes, we were just talking about this earlier actually, because um, so, uh, so I had no idea how to legally structure the team when I had people like all over the world. Um, I had no idea. I was just like, oh, it's fine. Like, I don't, it's fine. We we're paying them. It's cool. Like, taxes, what? What's, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I had, I had a few conversations with a few people, and I was like, okay, I need to actually pay attention to this stuff. Um, and so what I did first is I reached out to other companies that are quite big out there. If you guys are familiar with WordPress, if you've ever done any websites on WordPress, the company behind that is Automatic, and they have also a fully distributed team. I reached out to them, I reached out to Time Doctor, I reached out to like a bunch of other guys that are doing this. Not many companies are doing it, right? Um, and I was like, hey, so we're thinking about, you know, incorporating, like how do you guys set this up with your team all over the world legally? Like how are their contracts, blah, blah, blah. Everyone said across the board the same thing. Um, and even then eventually had a, a legal team and so we reached out to them and they're like, yep, this is how you have to do it. I'm like, okay, so how do you have to do it? <laughs> what you said, contractors. So Everyone is set up as a contractor, yeah. So, um, so nobody is a permanent, you have no permanent staff. You're, you're, everyone is on freelance contracts. And has, has that been an issue? I'll stop asking questions from here. But um, has that been an issue? Curious your business continuity. Do people tend to drop off? Sorry. Do, um, what's that meant in terms of business continuity? Um, if freelancers mm. are juggling perhaps numerous projects alongside working uh, for Mailbird? It's, it almost became somewhat of uh, just a discussion that I had with each team member, like saying, you know, I'm, I'm totally fine if you guys take on other work outside of, of Mailbird, but just so they understood that this is a full-time role that they're hired for, um, and I do expect, you know, they're, everyone, just like at any other company, has an annual performance review, so I look at, like, performance. Like, if you're definitely slacking and, you know, you're not delivering on what you're expected of, what you're expected to do, then we have another conversation. Um, so that hasn't really been an issue yet, but it could definitely be an issue later down the line, and we'll probably deal with it as it comes. Um, but so far, I really haven't had any issues. Like everyone understands from the beginning, I set the expectations. Hey, this is you know this is the deal when you're going to work with us, and we kind of deal with it from there. Um, but yeah, so it's it's a lot of gray area, I would say, still with this stuff. Um, but yeah, you just kind of have to work with it as you go. Because in the UK, you can't have a freelance contractor who works more than 16 hours a week for you. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I was just wondering, you know, how, how, would, yeah. how might we apply some of mm -hmm. the distributed, but yeah. Okay, that's very interesting, yeah. thank you. you like, like a lot of this stuff, like I would seek legal counsel in each of those regions, because even like our, our legal team is based in the US, we're a US company, but they, they will not advise on how to help like our team member in Austria, you know, They're, but they'll like, be like, hey, here's, so this actually gets quite expensive though. So this is actually, everyone's like, ooh, distributed team, it's quite like, you can, your operational costs are quite low, but it does add up once your team starts to grow and you need to consider all the legal implications with taxes and, and all this stuff. But yeah, so that's part of it. It's a, a business decision. And maybe, you know, if that becomes too crazy, then like maybe at some point we do say, okay, we're gonna move everyone to an office. You know, we have 50 people now. We're all gonna relocate everyone to the US and work from there, you know, and we're gonna fundraise in the US. Like, so, um, so far it hasn't been an issue, but those are also kind of things that happen with like when your company grows as well. Like the way you do things, like, like I said, we have a weekly meeting with everyone every Monday um, with the whole team, 13 people, not that many. If I have 50 people, I'm not gonna do that, obviously, right? So you make these little changes along the way as you grow. Um, but yeah, so um, I don't know. I hope that answered the question. But yeah, thank I, it, like it's it's there's I don't have a clear uh, answer for it, but because it is very gray still. Um, but yeah, 
legal advice, local legal advice is the best way to go. It's expensive, but yeah, if you want to do it right, <laughs> not get in trouble. Ooh, yeah. You said that you didn't graduate from, don't have IT background. So what makes you drive you that you want to be you to do the startup, the fintech and stuff like this? Um, so my first job when I graduated from college um, was at a market research firm, um, and I was what, with. What's your background? My background: I was going to be a social worker. It was in psychology. Yeah. So. Oh, you you graduate psychology? Yeah. So um, Gatesy was going to be a social worker. I had a minor in marketing as well, though, so I always had that to fall back on. So when I, I had my internship um, during my last year in school, um, doing like social work, and I was like, oh my god, I don't think I can do it. Like it's quite a challenging, like mentally mentally draining um, occupation to be in. And I was just like, I don't I don't know that that's something I want to do. And it, the pay wasn't very great either. Um, so I kind of fell back on my minor in marketing. And my first job out of college was with a market research firm. I was there for six years, and like I did really well in the company, and I just got you know promoted every year. I was like, wow, I'm on fire. This is great. But over time, the company culture was really just like awful. Like I, no one was happy going into work, so I quit. Um, and then I got the job with the software company. So this is my first time because it was a friend of mine's brother who started this company. They got investment. They were he's, you know typical story like started in their garage. You know like they're de developers and engineers. And it grew like so fast. And I was, I was like, I got a job with this company. And I was in their content department. So I was really inspired, actually, um, seeing this small tech company that started from a garage grow into this company that was like hiring a lot of people, providing new job opportunities for other people. And it was in tech. And I was like, OK, there's definitely some opportunity here. And like, you know, back in the day, I think when, like, if you were to ask, you know, many people's parents, you know, what you, their kid should be, you know, they probably, oh, a lawyer, a doctor, you know, one of these high paying jobs now. If you ask me, like, if, if when I have kids, like, what do I want them to be? I'm like, I want them to be a software engineer, you know, that's where the money is, that's where the job opportunities are, and the flexibility as well. So I think it's just, it's changed a lot. And I was just attracted to that after working at the software company and talking to some other friends that were also in this, in this industry. Um, I always wanted to start my own company as well. So it's kind of how I ended up there. I just started talking to people and you get introduced to people, you network, and that's how it happens. So my name's Stephanie, and I'm a speaker trainer, speaker, and but I'm setting up a new women's coaching practice for women to help them tap into their authentic feminine power in masculine paradigms, Ooh. particularly. So Ooh, this is a nice. lot of what you yeah. said was uh, <laughs> very, yeah, resonated. Cool. Yeah. So my question is, what's the one thing that you've learned along your journey that you wish you had known on day one that you can share with people that might be about to start up? Hmm. Ooh, one. <laughs> key, the one, the top key. That's hard. Thing. Oh, God. You can say two um, if you want. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna, I have to say two, because like, there's one that I would, be, it's more like advice. I would say, like, I think a lot of people in life and in business and in, uh, you know, their personal life, everything, like, a lot of times I think we focus so much on problems and no one ever, and we dwell on them and we don't do anything about it um, rather than focusing on, okay, here's a problem, let's look at, look at the solution. Similar with like when you're in this like teetering zone of like, should I start a company? Should I not? This is scary. I don't know. Well, I can't really because of that. You come up with all these excuses of why not to do it rather than thinking, okay, what can I do? You know, what solutions do I have? What can I work with to make it happen? So I think that's, the one thing, because that's something that I don't know, I just kind of figured out on my own, I think, over time. Also, being inspired by seeing other women doing it as well. Um, and then the other thing, I think, that if I were to do things all over again, um, I would probably start a lot sooner than I did um, talking about my business to other people um, to get feedback. Because um, the first thing you think, which is classic entrepreneurial mistake, is you don't you don't want anyone to know, you don't want anyone to steal your idea, like, no. So just talking to people and trying to get feedback as fast as possible. So yeah, two things. So feedback as fast as possible so you can learn fast and, and, and make changes that you need to for the business as quickly as possible to, to reach your goals of success for the business. And then also just focusing more in business and in personal lives um, on solutions and what you can do rather than just the problems. Hi, I'm Sue from the UK, and um, I've got a practice called Working Numbers, 
which I like to call a modern sort of accountancy practice rather than the old fashioned kind of um, approach. So my question is, I guess it was a pretty exciting time when you set up the company with your co-founders and it was probably really, you know, there's a lot to kind of plan and do. But as you grow and become profitable, the your strategy and perhaps your, your plans change. And I just wondered whether you've had to make any difficult decisions about the composition of the board um, as you've kind of matured and, and you know, grown. Mm. Yeah, like I would say we haven't had any mega drastic changes um, to the company since we started. Like, yeah, we've grown, we've got more users. I mean, I think the extent of the big changes have been like, okay, we need to hire more people now, you know? Um, so I think it's just a classic, like, what happens when your company starts to grow? Um, what else? Um, I think also learning over time. Um, you, you think, like, when you're growing your team, like, oh, we need these types of people to work with us. And then you do bring them on, and it doesn't quite work out. And then you have to let, make the hard decision to let them go. I mean, you know, it, it happens. So, um, but other than that, nothing really, I would say, dramatic we've had to endure yet. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and just very quickly, you mentioned that you chose a business model where it was a lifetime subscription and that you've changed that. So what's the current business model? Ah, um, so when I said we changed it, um, it's more price points. Um, so we have the freemium based model and then like changing what you get with the free version versus the paid version, the, the yearly subscription. And is there a different difference between the yearly subscription to the lifetime, one time purchase lump sum, right? So that's one of the things is just changes in the price points. We also actually started doing localized pricing. Um, so the price of Mailbird Pro in the US annually might be $12. In Indonesia, it might be $5, um, whatever converts best for that market. So that's another thing. And then in addition, so we're always looking for other revenue channels. Um, it was an advisor that I talked to at one point. He said, you should have at least five revenue generating engines for your business. Don't put everything into one basket, right? So if one goes down, you still got the other ones to support you. So other things that we're doing today is uh, affiliate marketing. Um, so looking at having affiliates and resellers help us market and bring our product to you know, their community or the people that they sell to. Um, and then we've done ads as well. Um, so ads and the final thing is um, partnerships. So partnerships was a huge thing if, in terms of like helping your business move forward, I think. Um, yeah, so like we've partnered up with uh, some of the most popular apps that we use today for work and, and productivity, like um, Evernote, you know, um, Time Doctor, Asana. These are guys that we actually use ourselves, and so we also like to give back to them and kind of promote them within our software as well. So, so things, yeah, we're still testing everything too. So, yeah. awesome. Do we have any other questions? Yep. Howdy. Uh, Hi. Brian, I was a bit late coming in, so maybe you already answered this, but why do you choose to live in Bali? Why did I choose to live in Bali? Or why did you choose to come back to Bali? Uh, why did I choose to come back to Bali? Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't know when I came here that I really was planning on being here long term. I thought I was really just going to be for a couple of months, figure it out, you know, like look, give it a shot at, at starting my own business. Um, but I mean, I, I mean, I absolutely just fell in love with Bali. Um, for me, it was an easy transition to come back. Um, because I lived in Indonesia for nine years prior to, you know, moving to the U.S. So coming back, I was like, oh, wow, I actually remember some of my bahasa. I was like, this is good. Everyone thinks I'm Indonesian, too, so it's great. I feel very welcomed. <laughs> like, I'm half Filipino, so. Um, but, yeah, so I, I just, I fell in love with Bali. Um, for me, it was just really important to be around nature and around good people. So what I found is the people that I was meeting here were very much in the same mindset, I think, as me. Um, so that was really nice. Um, and, you know, I grew up at, like, with an international background as well. And so I think the international community in Bali is quite incredible as well. Um, and it opens up so many doors for, for other opportunities. Like, I, I've done, like, 
because of being in Bali, it, I've gotten to meet some really cool people that have introduced me to other people that introduced me to other people that this is how we got our first fundraising, you know, for the company. I ended up doing like a ridiculous, no one watched it, like reality, like startup show in Singapore. Like it was just the most random stuff that has happened, but it's because of like the people that you get to meet here. Yeah. So I chose Bali because of many different reasons. Yeah. It's awesome. Do you have any more questions? I've got a question, if anyone else doesn't have one. More clarity. So I just want to get um, clear, Andrea, like more for, especially for the ladies uh, that are, and gents that are in the group. Um, so when, so you are working a job for, what, four years whilst you were building, building the company? Um, it was with a, sorry, I was with a software company for one year and it was during that one year is when I started. And it was for two months that I was um, still working at that company that I started working on Mailbird. Okay, so you're working for them, getting some cash flow, and then you started your own company. So you then you kept working on that company for two months, and then what? What funded you to keep actually building the company over the next couple of years? We, between the founders, injected our own capital to kind of bootstrap the company initially, and we were li literally living off of savings okay. um, until then. Yeah. For what? How many years? Like one year, two years? It was about two years. Yeah. Okay, so you'd build up a bit of savings, you know, you worked for a little bit, and then you started a company, and then you bootstrapped it for two years. Yeah. So that gives some context, I guess, for, for a lot of the stuff we're talking about today, yeah? Because a lot of people are working, and they're thinking about either starting mm -hmm. a company or maybe partnering and leveraging with other companies to then take the next step. Um, and just another thing, like, lifestyle-wise, um, what do you do outside of work? Like, what's your day look like? Um. Okay, so when I lived in the U.S., I, I would say I had a very, like, it was not very healthy. Like, I wasn't exercising. I was eating, you know, cheeseburgers and drinking beer. <laughs> um, when I moved to Bali, I, I think I became more health conscious. Um, so I started, like, exercising more, and I was finding that, like, wow, this actually helps me feel a lot better, especially when I'm working. I had a lot more clarity. I was, I was more productive. And then I, from there, I started exploring other things, you know. Um, so, like, I like to surf. Um, I really enjoy surfing now. Um, and that's also great because it's another community that, you know, you get to be a part of as well, being here. I was kind of like, I'm not going to surf just because I live in Bali, but I kind of got sucked into it a little bit. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. Just I, I like I like nature, and that's part of a big reason why I, I moved here. Um, so, yeah, I like to go to the beach and surf and yep. uh, climb mountains. I actually climbed Mount Agung. That was the most difficult thing ever. Yep. Yes, the volcano that was erupting. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that was hard. But yeah, so I, I, I do a lot of different things, I think, outside of when I'm not working. Yeah, and like your daily rituals, like you wake up, where does work fit in? Do you take the mornings off? Do you work in the afternoons? Like, how does it work in Bali? Early mornings, I like doing, I never used to be an early morning person, but now I am. Uh, this is, I don't know what happened. Um, but I like to get up early, and usually I'll do some kind of, like, exercise, whether it's surfing, along, you know, run on the beach, um, I'll go to a class, maybe do yoga, whatever. Uh, so I like to start off the morning like that because otherwise my brain's not ready yet. <laughs> and then after I do that, then I, I will start and dig into work. So it usually starts around like 9 or 10. Um, and then some days I, you know, work super late in the evenings and other days I don't. So I think it's important for me, like, if you go to like a classic setup where you go to an office, you have 9 to 5, whatever, I, I find that it's like, why do we do that to employees, you know, to ourselves? <laughs> Sometimes you're just like, my brain is not in the right mindset to be working right now, so why am I going to force it? You're not going to be productive. You're not going to like do well with what you're working on. Um, so I think that's good to figure out that balance. It's not easy to do, but like, yeah. I mean, still figuring it out after six years of doing this. So, <laughs> so yeah, so finding balance, I think, is important for all of that. Um, yeah, so I think every day is a little different, but I do... I used to work weekends a lot before, but now I really, and even for their whole team, I'm like, weekends are off, like, take that time off. Yeah. So just to, to wrap it all up, uh, there was one question I was going to ask you, which is what's the most embarrassing and awkward moment you've had in business? And then you started talking about a reality TV show out of Singapore. So I think we all want to know, what's the story there? Can I pretend that I didn't say it? <laughs> it's too late, too late. No, that was really weird. I, I know Christina remembers. Like, we were, this is, you know, we, we were staying in a villa, working together with our team. Everyone was in Bali. And 
like I got this random email and I was like, yeah, we're interested in having you participate in the startup show. It's called Startup. And I was like, okay. And I was like, that's a little crazy and terrifying. I don't really care to do this. But then I was like, no, this is a great marketing opportunity. We can get the male bird name out there as much as possible to like masses. And so I applied and like it was this ridiculous long process. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I was in Singapore for two weeks and doing this ridiculous like reality startup show. They, I think they were trying to make it like The Apprentice. And I, I will say that I wasn't very happy with how it turned out because what I was hoping to get out of it, I didn't. Um, so it was a good experience, but I, I would not do it again. <laughs> I'll put it that way. So it was called Startup. Yes. So if someone wanted to go search YouTube episodes. What? Yeah. What? What? What did I say? Next question. That, that's, that, that's awesome, though. Um, I, I've done a few silly things myself, which have led on to amazing opportunities that you never would have expected. So, so good on you. Um, and so to, to wrap it all up, uh, you've got this opportunity now to, to share anything you'd want uh, that, you know, if you could have last words of wisdom to share with the group, what would they be? Um, I think, like, I'm probably going to bring it back to your question, um, which is to, yeah, again, just, like, get feedback as soon as possible um, and focus on solutions. That would be it. Like, yeah, because I think that's one of the things that we get so stuck on is being afraid to, like, move forward, take the next step, or the problem. So just focusing on the solutions and just, and just doing it. And you're going to screw up, so, like, oh, well, you know. I've had so many screw-ups with Mailbird, like... <laughs> So many, but you learn so much from them. So I think, yeah, that would be my two cents for, for people. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Can we give Andrea a round of applause? Thank you. And so what time do you need to be home? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We got an hour's <laughs> drive. <laughs> I'm an early riser now. I didn't used to be. <laughs> but yeah. But no, I'll, I'll hang up probably for a little yeah. bit, yeah. It would be awesome. fun to catch up with people oh, here, yeah. We both live like 10 minutes from each other, so we got an hour's ride back through crazy Bali traffic. Woo. So cool. So thank you all very much for joining us. Um, if you'd like to ask Andrea any other questions, she'll be around for the next 15 minutes or so. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.